So we move to the next uh, presenter. Professor Liam Burke, yeah, before that, I would like to read his uh, CV. Associate Professor Liam Burke is the discipline leader in cinema and screen studies at Swinburne University of Technology, Australia. Also a member of the Liam has published widely on comic books and adaptation. His book include the comic books film adaptation, exploring modern Hollywood's leading genre, superhero movies, and the edited collection, Fun Phenomena, Batman. His most recent book, the edited collection, the superhero symbols with Ian Gordon and Angela Dalianis was published by Rutgers University Press in 2019. Liam is the chief investigator of the Australian Research Council funded project Superhero and Me. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Associate Professor Liam Burke with the, was it, uh, navi navigating something, right? Navigating national identity. Na na navigating nationalism. Okay, Liam, the floor is yours, please. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much to the organizers. I'm just going to take a moment to uh, share my screen. So I'm just going to make sure that this one works the way it should. Um, okay, that's not quite loud. Okay, we can see the slide clearly. Great. I'm just going to play around with it so you can see a portion of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so you can see everything now, you can hear me? I'll get a thumbs up from someone, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, okay, I'll, I'll start then. Um, so yes, yeah, so my name's, uh, so when well, I'm Associate Professor Liam Burke, I am the, as the introduction kind of detailed, I'm the discipline leader of cinema and screen studies at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. That's where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, but this is not an Australian accent. I am originally from Ireland. So today I'm going to talk about Australian superheroes and Irish superheroes. And I'm really going to discuss what happens when this very almost uniquely American archetype is reworked around the globe and some of the tensions that emerge between you know, national identity and this very American archetype. So the Scottish comic book writer Grant Morrison said that like jazz and rock and roll, the superhero is a uniquely American uh, creation. Created in the uh, kind of depths of the depression as a response to the challenges of the machine age, superheroes were a modern update of the Western gunfighter. Superman demonstrated this machine age resilience on his first cover by effortlessly smashing a car against a rock face, a feat he bettered uh, in the first page when he hurdles a 20-story building in a single bound and out paces and express train. And these US origins were part of the superheroes longstanding appeal internationally, but it also provoked wider concerns regarding cultural imperialism. For instance, one article published in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, you know, kind of warned readers this back in 1948, that the language used in many of the comics on sale in Sydney show an unmistakably uh, an unmistakably United States origin. So international comic creators have traditionally tended to avoid the superhero genre. When local superheroes were created, they tended to be either satiric, such as the Japanese One Punch Man, or they tended to sometimes be uh, anti-heroic, like the Italian Fumetti Neri uh, Diabolique, or as is the case with Grant Morrison's British superhero Zenish, both. Oh, sorry, this is moving around funny. Uh, what's that? 
these international superheroes kind of implicitly comment upon and often critique perceived American cultural imperialism. However, with increased globalization, the superhero has been reimagined in a range of contexts to respond to local cultures, politics, and traditions. Nonetheless, the internationalization of superheroes has not happened in a single bound. Many regions' cultural and national traditions have resisted the conventions of the superhero genre. So today I'm going to focus on examples from Ireland and Australia. And this paper will consider how the tensions between cultural nationalism and the star-spangled superhero are slowly being resolved. I'm going to draw on creator and fan interviews I have carried out as part of a larger project I've worked on for the past few years called Superheroes and Me. And this paper is kind of going to look at how the growing number of international creators working for US publishers like Marvel and DC Comics have provided a corrective to outdated depictions of the superhero genre. And so the kind of the paper will ultimately chart how the careful integration of superhero conventions with local traditions, mythology and culture is transforming the American superhero into a global icon. So although there are enough superheroes clad in the Stars and Stripes, Union Jack and Maple Leaf for political geographer Jason Dittmer to recognize national superheroes as a subgenre, there have been comparatively few Irish and Australian team heroes. Many, many years ago, I had the opportunity to interview Stan Lee, and I asked him whether he ever thought about creating an Irish superhero, to which the one-time Captain America writer responded, I don't know how to make a superhero specifically Irish. Similarly, when I did some audience research with Australian comic book fans, uh, when asked to name Australian superheroes, many of the fan respondents struggled to identify any, and those that did tended to point to international examples like the DC villain Captain Boomerang, who'd recently been reworked as an anti-hero in the superhero movie Suicide Squad. Despite the comparative dirt of Irish and Australian superheroes, superhero comics do occasionally include Irish and Australian characters or set adventures in those regions. However, as traditionally all American comics were made by a couple of hundred people living in New York, these comics tended to rely on outdated, often atavistic conventions for depicting Ireland and Australia. As Scott McLeod notes in Making Comics, that some prejudices can creep in when using seemingly innocuous character types, explaining that every stereotype comes from somewhere and that place may, that place may not always be obvious. So the conventions for depicting Irish and Australian characters in uh, comics has rarely been politically charged, but rather it's designed to create authentic characters. Nonetheless, these often perpetuate colonial representations of these regions and their people. And kind of chart that I'm first going to start with Victorian, how Victorian era depictions, so that's late 1800s depictions of the Irish, can still be found in contemporary superhero comics. So during the late 1800s, uh, Irish efforts to gain home rule from Britain were gathering pace. Nonetheless, many British people feared that an independent Ireland would lead to the dissolution of the empire. And, uh, and this kind of anxiety was often illustrated in Victorian era cartoons. And the American historian L.P. Curtis observed that the Irish tended to fall into two categories in these uh, satirical cartoons. They're either Neanderthal-like beasts who cannot be reasoned with, or demure ladies who needed protection from Irish nationalists. As the media scholar Michael Deny notes, these images ultimately reinforced long-standing prejudice about the people of Ireland and undercut their claims for self-government. Curtis describes how this apes and angels dichotomy crossed the Atlantic where it became an ethnic fixture in the cartoons about Irish Americans. Curtis goes on to describe how in satirical magazine Puck, the artist Frederick Burr Upper excelled at simonizing Irish Americans. Upper would later become one of the pioneers of the newspaper comic strip with his popular character, Happy Hooligan, an imbecilic Irish itinerant. Much of the humor in Happy Hooligan was derived from Irish stereotypes Upper had spent years cultivating in satirical magazines and which he now helped embed in the grammar of the fledgling comic strip where its impact can still be seen today. Film scholar Martin McLuhan observed that the most positive or at least less negative face of Irish primitivism is a depiction of Ireland as a garden of Eden, populated by simple, musically gifted, loquacious and happy, if quarrelsome, peasantry. While these stage Irish stereotypes might be dismissed as benign, even affectionate, they were employed in Victorian cartoons to suggest that the Irish were unable to rule themselves. 
One example of this convention in kind of superhero comics was the Irish X-Men Sean Cassidy, better known as Banshee, who joined the superhero team in 1975. In the comics, Banshee is rarely seen without his clay pipe, which Curtis identifies as a signifier of Irish ethnicity in late 1800s US cartoons. Banshee often completes this look with a flat cap and green jumper. Cassidy even wears the signifiers to a formal dinner he hosts for the X-Men at his home, prompting Wolverine to suggest that Banshee looks like a stable hand, to which Cassidy counters, since I happen to be the lord of this manor, I get to come to dinner dressed however I please. As that near incomprehensible dialogue suggests, accent is another means of signifying Banshee's Irish identity. As part of wider research on representations of Irish speech, sociolinguist Shane Walsh argues that such elisions, reductions of weak forms, are meant to reflect the common perception of Irish people speaking quickly and unclearly. Banshee's primitivism is also illustrated through the depiction of Ireland as a pre-modern paradise. During the intergalactic conflict of the Phoenix Saga, the X-Men were sent on vacation by Professor X, with Banshee offering up his childhood home. Located in a remote part of County Mayo, few conveniences, fewer people. The X-Men reached this ancient location by increasingly archaic modes of transport before it's ultimately revealed that Banshee grew up in a castle infested with leprechauns. Similar depictions of Ireland as a pre-industrial utopia can be found across a range of comics. However, as McLuhan notes, this vision of Irish rural backwardness was often uh, owes more to culture of the centre than realities of life in the periphery, as in keeping with the infantilizing tendencies that many scholars have identified in colonial representations of Ireland. While the good-natured peasants living in an untouched Garden of Eden is one set of conventions associated with the Irish, much like Bruce Banner, these images often transform into a violent shade of green. McClune notes that Ireland is often presented as a society torn asunder by violence, where proclivity to violence was seen as a tragic flaw of the Irish themselves. This again was often presented as the result of ignorance and a lack of progress. These conventions became more overt in comics that engage with Irish conflicts, particularly those that centered on the sectarian violence or troubles that dogged Northern Ireland from the late 1960s to the 1990s. Curtis notes how the conflict prompted some British newspaper cartoonists to revive the guerrilla guerrilla image. While superhero books stopped short at such extreme character types, they did widely participate in the myth of atheism, which Ruth Barton describes as a two tribes interpretation of loyalist Republican sectarianism, with violence seen as endemic to the human condition and in particular Irish nature, with McClune noting that this tradition ends up denying the historical, social and political roots of such violence. For instance, the 1982 Captain Britain story, Friends and Neighbours, was intended by writer David Torp to engage directly with the troubles in Northern Ireland, but artist Alan Davis felt that it was inappropriate to have a guy dressed in Union Jack flying over to Ireland and sorting out the entire Northern Ireland situation. Following editorial pressure, Torp left the book, with the story changed to an anonymous gang conflict. Nonetheless, the original concept is clear. Captain Britain lands in a city center street to save a teenager, Jeff, from a gang attack. Jeff's friend explains, we met on holiday, but he's not from around here, and there's a war going on. So, so this is kind of like, they've, they, they kept the original concept of the story, but they didn't explicitly set it in Northern Ireland, but you can kind of tell that the, uh, from the story, because the gang do not understand why Captain Britain, who wears the Union Jack, is not on their side, which is loyalist, while Jeff's neighborhood nationalists greet his savior with suspicion. Sorry, I just think somebody might have their microphone open. I don't, uh, if somebody wants to close their microphone, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, someone has their microphone open, uh, if they could close that, that'd be awesome, thank you. Uh, I'll continue anyway. Conflict erupts only for Captain Britain's sidekick. Jack Dawes uses telepathic powers to bring about a peace brokered over a shared love of tea. Even under the tin veneer of metaphor, this story perpetuates the myth of atheism that pervades many media by reducing the troubles to a localized conflict, forgetting the colonial history and complicated political landscape underlying the violence. Barton describes how such simplifications have allowed the British government to appear as honest broker in a battle between two sides of warring fanatics. 
Okay, folks, okay. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but someone has their mic open, so if you could just shut it down, that'd be really helpful. Uh, so why those fanatics should have appeared at this point is considered to be a matter in the so far distant past as to be unworthy of consideration. This apes and angels dichotomy um, is so embedded in the DNA of comic books that even those superheroes identified as Irish American continue the theme. When Irish American writer artist Frank Miller began his celebrated run of Daredevil, he relied on familiar stereotypes to emphasize the character's Irish American roots. For instance, Daredevil's uh, Boxer Fodder became a hard drinking wreck who was physically abusive to the young Matt Murdock, while the hero's previously deceased mother was re revealed to be alive and well and living as a nun. More recently, Captain America's background was revisited in a storyline that details Steve Rogers' childhood as the son of Irish immigrants growing up in a New York tenement. Conforming to type, Steve's father is an abusive drunk who believes that his inability to find work is because the foreman hates Irish, while his mother is a paragon of virtue. Similarly, when Miguel O'Hara, the Spider-Man of 2099, was introduced, he also had an abusive Irish father, suggesting that Marvel had anticipated that the Irish would continue to be apes and angels well into the 21st century. Stereotypes were also regularly enlisted by US creators in creating Australian superheroes or setting adventures in the region. For instance, Australian superhero creator Ryan Griffin highlighted how the little known Avenger manifolds as an example of an indigenous Australian hero, but cautioned these are superheroes that were created by people outside of Australia, and they're just using either stereotypes or what they can quickly Google to help fuel the creation of the characters. Traditionally, Australian characters in international comics were rare. For example, while the Batman of all nations team up from 1955 included Ranger from far away Australia, he only received two lines of dialogue in the issue and was not included when the team reappeared in World's Finest Comics in 1957. This apathy vanished in the late 1980s when the international success of outback heroes like Mad Max and Crocodile Dundee led to wider interest in Australia. Comic book publishers also attempted to take advantage of this unprecedented interest. For instance, in 1988, Batman fought the boomerang wielding Aborigine, Tank Girl roamed a post-apocalyptic Australia with her kangaroo boyfriend, and the X-Men moved their headquarters to the Outback. These comics tended to perpetuate depictions of Australia as a frontier free from the stifling conformity of progress. For example, anticipating the casting of Australian actor Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, X-Men Rogue comments on her teammates' seeming suitability to the Australian outback. Wolvie loves the wilderness. It's as elemental as he is. A country where you work the nature schedule and rules, not some arbitrary man-made timepiece. So it must be acknowledged that some of the responsibility for perpetuating these outdated conventions rests with the cultural nationalist policies in Ireland and Australia. As tourism scholar Sue Beaton notes, since Federation in 1901, Australian culture has often sought to forge a distinct identity by positioning the Australian bush and bushmen as a symbol of nationalism. This tactic served to differentiate Australia from European urban centres by depicting Australia as a distant and often unforgiving rural landscape thinly populated by a humble but hardworking people. However, in an effort to forge a distinct national identity, such cultural nationalism has implicitly endorsed colonialist images of Australia. This tradition has continued, with many scholars pointing out how despite Australia being one of the most urbanized countries in the world, local arts and culture often depict the nation as a blank canvas, free from the restrictions of the modern world. With the proven success of outback set Australian stories, there's often been little appetite amongst local or international creators to move superhero adventures to the urban, uh, to the urban environments where superheroes traditionally operate. With no buildings to leap in a single bound, how can a Superman test his metal in the outback? This mythologized terrain does produce heroes, with many of the studies respondents pointing to Bushmen descendants, Crocodile Dundee, when identifying local heroes, but noted that these heroes did not align with the classical superhero for typical responses, including, could you imagine someone like Crocodile Dundee being a superhero with a cape? Part of the incompatibility between the superhero and the Australian rural battler is the Bushman's inability to accommodate what Grant Morrison identifies as a transcendent element in the superhero equation, the secret identity. 
sociologist Karina J. Butera notes of the toughness, independence, and resilience of Australian masculinity and mateship that overt displays of vulnerability or emotion are to be avoided. The superhero's transformation from a mild-mannered civilian to a paragon of masculinity is widely considered a key convention of the genre and central to the superhero's appeal. While the urban centers of US superhero stories allow the characters to hide out as reporters and playboy billionaires, the unrelenting rural experience of the Bushman and his descendants does not permit such moments of vulnerability. Indeed, Ruth Rose Lucas describes Mad Max as a Superman who refuses the costume of the ordinary. Clark Kent wouldn't last five minutes in this mythic outback. Although traditional Australian heroic types are at odds with the superhero's vulnerable civilian identity, they also tend to resist the garishness of the costume clad alter ego. In his article, An Australian Superman, philosopher Damon Young imagines what would have happened if the infant Superman had landed in the Australian outback rather than the cornfields of Kansas. Uh, Noting the centrality of the image of the tough, simple, hardworking diggers to Australian national identity, Young concludes that his Australian Superman is more likely to have become a cautious provincial survivor than a messianic hero. This democratic spirit still resonates in Australian cultural life and is often demonstrated through the notion of tall poppy syndrome, which journalist Peter Harcher identifies an as an unspoken national ethos that no Australian is permitted to assume that he or she is better than any other Australian. How is this enforced? By the prompt corrective of levelling derision. It's harder to imagine a taller poppy than the spandex-clad pop and jays who leap from the covers of US comics. As Wonder Woman artist Nicola Scott, she's from Australia, she's city-based, says, our superheroes are like Mad Max. When I think of an Australian superhero, I don't think of someone wearing spandex. That's a really American image. The fans and creators that I interviewed consistently point to, to the tenets of Australian national identity, including the outback, bushman, and egalitarianism when describing local heroes, with many suggesting that these qualities were at odds with the urban, optimistic, and individualistic superhero. While these qualities were often used to forge a distinct Australian national identity, these foundational myths do not align with the experiences of many Australians who today live in one of the world's most urbanized countries. The Australian superhero fans struggled to imagine superheroes existing in a local context testifies to the hegemonic dominance of this particular brand of national identity. As Australia was seeking to distinguish itself from Britain in the late 1800s, a similar culturalist nationalist movement emerged in Ireland to augment political efforts. To emphasize a distinct Irish national identity, this cultural movement defined itself in opposition to modern urban Britain by focusing on rural life, Catholicism, and an imagined heroic past. However, as McClue notes, in accepting and promoting a romantic rural sense of Irish identity, therefore cultural nationalism ironically accepted one of the great stereotypes of Ireland produced by imperialism. The influence of the cultural nationalist movement is still evident in Ireland today, with promotional materials, films, and other aspects of culture making use of widely recognized but antiquated conventions. So perhaps it's unfair to criticize international comic creators for using the stereotypes that Ireland and Australian uh, Australia often employed for economic benefit. This irony was definitely satirized in Garth Ennis's 1991 Judge Dredd story arc, Emerald Isle. As an Irish creator, uh, Ennis was well positioned to subvert the misconceptions held about Ireland while also highlighting the role of the Irish play, play in promoting them. In the story, Dredd investigates the death of an ambassador killed with a roast potato to the head. Dredd's search brings him to Emerald Isle, formerly Ireland, which was developed as a team park littered with stereotypes from Ireland's past, including leprechauns, thatched cottages, and farms. Emerald Isle raises often ignored questions about the disconnect between the stereotypes of Ireland and the reality, as well as the complicity of the Irish in fostering the outdated images they so often condemn. In the past, Irish comic creators have been rare, with the few comics that did appear often relying on wider stereotypes. Originally from County Down in Northern Ireland, preacher creator Garth Ennis was arguably the first Irish comic creator to gain an international reputation. His breakout book was Troubled Souls, which first appeared in the short-lived British comics anthology Crisis. The Belfast set drama tells the story of a young man caught up in sectarian violence. 
When I interviewed uh, Garth Ennis a couple of years ago about his intention for this story, he explained how he wanted to avoid the usual comic book treatment of Northern Ireland, although at that point there was precious little. I did think it cropped up now and again in Batman and Spider-Man. I showed him this particular Spider-Man comic set in Northern Ireland, and he'd, he, he remarked to me, I can vaguely remember seeing imagery like this and thinking, well, we won't do it this way. Troubled Souls challenges representations of Ireland providing a story where Eden is an illusion, revolutionaries are rarely romantic, and modern conflicts defy historical simplifications. That example demonstrates the need for local creators to redress imbalances in comic books, including superhero stories. In recent years, both Ireland and Australia have seen an increase in comic book creators working on local books, with some going on to write and draw superheroes for international publishers. Irish comic book creator Will Sliney attributes Ireland's unprecedented production to the web's ability to narrow boundaries. He says, I think it basically bowing down to people realizing here that you could do those kind of jobs. I would have imagined there was plenty of generations of artists before us that would have had the same interests, but they wouldn't have had the same reach because they weren't able to show their work online. As a comparatively new nation, the US lacked an obvious folkloric tradition a vacuum superheroes helped, helped fill. However, as Grant Morrison notes with British superheroes, local legend could be relied upon to produce superheroes from whole cloth. Similarly, Irish creators are frequently drawn on local myth to develop their heroes. For instance, the Irish legendary warrior Coo Cullen not only gets a Kirby-esque biography in Celtic Warrior, but is evoked in comics such as The Wren, Hound, and Big Bastard. In the final pages of Celtic Warrior, Cradle Will Sliney links the mythological Coo Cullen with real-life Irish revolutionary leader Michael Collins over a montage of heroes who fought for us so that every generation of Irish people can assert their right to freedom and sovereignty. In his book on the origin of superheroes, Chris Gavler demonstrates the close proximity of the superhero to the revolutionary, explaining oppression is radiation. It's the original cosmic gamma ray bomb or spider mutation that births the hero. In Irish comics, the boundary between superhero and revolutionary com collapses completely, with real-life Republican figures such as Michael Collins, Wolf Tone, and Countess Markovich reimagined as superheroes in books like The League of Volunteers, Celtic Clan, and The Crimson Blade. Although Irish comics rework the revolutionary as a superhero, they also highlight the political and historical issues omitted or glossed over by international titles. For instance, the first issue of The Crimson Blade focuses on the influence of the American and French revolutions on the Irish Rebellion of 1798. There's also a sustained effort to unpack dichotomies that pervade depictions of Ireland. Glimmerman and the League of Volunteers acknowledge that Irish people serve on both sides of the Spanish Civil War. Further dispelling lazy contrast, Protestant characters in the Crimson Blade are amongst the staunchest supporters of the Irish Free State. However, it must be acknowledged that these books have comparatively small readership, thus their capacity to challenge long-standing stereotypes is limited. As Will Sliney, who transitioned from his early Irish comics to drawing Spider-Man from Marvel, explained, as the industry here is growing and people's reputations are growing, international publishers are coming here to find their stories. Per capita, we probably have more people working in Marvel than anyone else. Indeed, Sliney joins a host of Irish creators such as Stephen Byrne, Declan Shavley, and Maura McHugh, who began their careers working for Irish publishers before moving to US superhero titles like Justice League, Deadpool, and Hellboy. These creators are now in a position to redress outdated conventions in international publications. For instance, Shavley recently published the Limerick set novel, uh, graphic novel Savage Town with US publisher Image Comics. Uh, he described how he wanted to show that Iron is not the picturesque tourist postcard image that everybody has gotten used to seeing. Shavley, like his contemporaries, has never been better positioned to dismantle outdated conventions and allow more balanced depiction of Ireland to flourish on the page. In recent years, the ever uh, sorry, five minute left. Five minutes, that's all I need. About less, thank you. Uh, so in recent years, the ever-shrinking digital world has enabled Australian creators to shape these US icons, with many Australian writers and artists working in high-profile US comics. As Tom Taylor, who writes Spider-Man and Suicide Squad, argues, there, are enough there aren't enough Australian superheroes, and there definitely should be more. Taylor has based some of his US comics in Australia. 
For instance, in one Melbourne set in Justice Story, a local superhero attempts to assert Australian sovereignty in the face of the now villainous Superman, but his powers are revealed to be a dull imitation of the Man of Steel, and he's quickly overpowered. Now, this could be read as a metaphor for how US superhero comics dominate Australia, but it could also point to the subtle influence that Australian creators are now able to cast over an increasingly global comic book industry. Taylor Superman does not touch down in some mythologized Australian outback, but an accurate depiction of urban Australia with details specific to the writer's Melbourne. The success of these Australian creators helps to dismantle the stereotypes of an outdated national identity. Nonetheless, these are still US comics, but in 2016, local creators offered a significant contribution to the superhero pantheon that was unambiguously Australian. Clever men. At the center of the Australian superhero TV show and comic Cleverman is Cohen West, a reluctant superhero who has recently become the Cleverman, a conduit for Australia's First Nations people to the dreaming. In his essay, The Cultural Cringe, Arthur Phillips identifies a lack of distinct cultural traditions in Australia for prompting unfavorable comparisons between local artistic works and those produced overseas. However, Cleverman makes use of indigenous Australian culture to serve as a point of differentiation. But Ryan Griffin explaining, these are 60,000 year old stories that have never been told in this sort of realm. And that's what makes us unique. And that's what broadcasters around the world are looking for. Something new, something different. Through a deft mix of indigenous mythology and superhero conventions, Cleverman demonstrates it is possible to reconcile those tensions that once kept Australia and the superhero apart. So to wrap up quickly, superheroes were born in the glass and steel of 1930s American cities and in updating the Western gunfighter, they became to exemplify what Chouet and Lawrence described as the American monomyth. For much of their comic book history, these characters tended to be written and illustrated by New York-based artists whose efforts to create international characters often relied on stereotypes. In the past, international comic book creators have been cautious about contributing to a genre synonymous with U.S. cultural imperialism. However, with the growing global popularity of superheroes across multiple media platforms, there has been concerted efforts to rework the superhero in a number of countries and regions. As the Irish and Australian examples discussed in this paper illustrate, these efforts to extend the superhero globally can sometimes meet resistance with the conventions of the distinctly US genre, chafing with the conventions of, a, uh, of that cultural nationalism. However, as Jason Dittmer notes, even if the superhero genre is primarily associated with the United States and carries the trace of its origins, is nonetheless a resolutely transnational phenomenon whose appeal exceeds beyond national borders. Indeed, emboldened by the web, local, interna local international comic book communities have blossomed in recent years, with the creators better placed to adapt the superhero to a local setting. Some of these creators have gone on to shape the superhero internationally, challenging outdated stereotypes. The successful examples from Ireland and Australia in this paper are joined by other international contributions, such as the Barclay Avenger from Pakistan, the Austrian superheroes, and Tabby Poe from the Philippines, that also balance local interests with high-flying adventures. Collectively, these international superheroes and their creators and fans are helping to turn an American archetype into a global icon. And I'll leave that there. <laughs>